of our convocation. We have been richly blessed. We pray today as we focus on the family and how the family can reap the harvest that you will enlighten us, those of us who are here in the sanctuary and those who are online. Bless us today. Bless our speakers as they shall come forth. And we pray that you will just guide and keep us throughout this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Praise God. All right, so we're going to go right into our first presentation. All right. Sister Lewis, okay, happy to see you. Are we ready for you now, please, ma'am? Minister Delmarie Lewis, we want you to do the, the, um, the usual icebreaker. Put your hands together for Sister Dell. She prefers to work from. Oh, God. praise the Lord, everyone. I'm just sizing up the group to see which one to use. Um, I guess the group is small. All right. So we're going to be doing the. A uh, human block um, untangling. So I'm going to ask eight persons. We have eight. How many we have here? I guess everybody can. Yeah. You want to be in it? You want to be in it? Do you want to participate? All right. So we could have six and six. Because we want to see how quickly standing so we're going to have one group here and one group here please no you're going to stand right here St you're going to stand you're going to form a circle right here over there Six, come now, Mrs. Stabron. Six. Evangelists are going to be a part of it, too. How many do we have there? Six. Now we need six. All right, good. So the aim of the game is that you're going to be doing interlocks. Don't, you're going to reach for the person's hand. Okay, first thing, stretch out your right hand. Everybody, your right hand out. Stretch out your right hand. Right. Make sure you know your right hand. Are you going to reach right hand? Right? Okay. You know your right hand? Right hand? Okay. All right, right. So you're going to reach out for another person's right hand, but not the person next to you. Understood? Right. So grab that person's hand, but it should not be the person next to you. Make sure. All right. Everybody has that? Good. All right. You're going to reach out your left hand and reach to somebody different. Not the same person, you know. Make sure you're not holding the same person's hand. So who will hold her hand? No, you can't hold the person next to you.
No, not the same person. All right. All right, guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to ask, who wants to be just a spectator? Because eight is good. Yeah. All right, so the two kids, you can see. Join, join, join. Adults join. The kids, you can see. All right, so the same thing, put out your right hand. Make as much room as you can. Come over to the middle, right here, so you have more space. Middle, middle. Come, no, just come first. Come with the circle. You can't let go the hand then. Don't let go, let go, let go. All right. All right, so make the circle again. You may have a nice circle. All right, right hand out. Just put out your right hand. Don't hold anybody hand yet. Just put out your right hand. So you're going to grab somebody's right hand, but not the person close to you. Not next to you. Put out your left hand. And hold somebody's hand, but not next to you. And not the same person. Not the same person you were holding before. Everybody should be holding two hands. Right. So the left hand now. Put in your left hand. No, how many persons do you have here? Is 10? No, 10? No, you have an even number? Let me see. Say one, two, three, four. A ten. Yeah, man, so you're good. And not the same person you're holding before. All right. So the aim of this game now, hold on tight. All right. Listen now. Everybody has a hand or two hands. Guess what? Now you're going to untangle yourself to form another circle without letting go. So you, who can do gymnastics? Bend, you must bend, twist, turn, and get it out. You're going to untangle yourselves. Untangle, so you can look and see where you can start the untangling. You maybe have to turn behind, go below. Ready? <laughs> All right, start moving. I don't know. They want to take a picture of the circle. Let me your camera. Find the camera. Oh, yeah, right, perfect form. All right, so untangle it, entangled. Loose it, loose it, loose it, loose it. see who, the, who exercise this morning and who is flexible. Come. Come, Sister Brown, you can do it. Yes, man. Yeah. Good. Turn around the circle, it doesn't have to be 
Everybody facing in the circle. You can't turn him or There we go. Yeah. Turn back. You can you can turn back. You can turn around. You can you can move in different directions, but don't let go. Come back, come back on the Yes. Uh -huh. See, then me out of the circle. Uh, <laughs> all right. Somebody can turn, flip. No. Give me double jet. Let go, let go, let go. All right, it seems like we're going to be a while with this. So guess what now? What did we learn from this lesson? So we can't go. We can't get away from each other. And communication is very important. Our exercise is important too. That you have to bend and you have to twist. And you have to strategize. You have to strategize. But it can happen, but I guess we'd have to have some more time. And I see some people sweating, so boy, it's a lot. But come again, circle. Everybody in a circle. In a circle, this one you're going to be doing a little clapping, ring game, clapping, not twisting. Sister Bev, you're not twist this time. You're not bending, are you? Okay, Bev tired. All right. Anybody knows this ring game? Hands up. Hands up.
Penina and who? Oh, LK now. Wow. Put your hands together for them. So they named some couples in the Bible. Can anybody remind me of some of the couples that they named in the Bible? Yes? Sarah and Abraham. Did somebody say that one? Yes? Give, give him a clap. Adam and Eve. Mary and Joseph. Yes, you said Adam and Eve. So those were couples in the Bible, and that's very good. You know, sometimes when you're sitting comfortably, they come quicker to you. But when you're under pressure and you're on stage, it's like everything just flies out of the head. So give them a bigger clap than that. That was very good. Very good. It's good to know that we have couples coming from Genesis right down. Not quite sure of Revelation, but there are couples named right throughout the Bible. So today, we're doing family day. We're not just doing couples. We're doing singles. We're doing everybody that makes up the church. This is family day. And when we talk about family day at church, it has to be a little different from the regular service that is like a Bible study. So don't feel too strange if you see us doing some games. You are not out of place, all right? In order for the family to, ba to band together and to bond together, we have to be different, okay? We have to feel free. You have to feel comfortable. When you're at home with family, you feel different from when you're in church, don't you? Right. So this is what we're doing. We're bonding all families together. And we are happy to have all ages here today. We have seniors, we have young people, we have children, and this is what a true family looks like. So, very happy to have you here today. And for those of you who called in to say you want to be on social media, welcome to Family Day. And I'm going to ask those behind the column and there just to come and join us here so that the others can see us together while they are on social media. Evangelists, happy to have you with us. you have any word for these young people and family members? You have been there, and we just want you, even as a mother in the church, just to tell us, just for two minutes, anything to encourage us. Because the topic for today is harvesting in the family. All right, we want our families to remain together. How many of you know that many people or young people, as soon as they reach 18, some of them stray away from church? Do you notice that? Yes, we have our younger people. And anybody can tell me why you think that happens? What are some of the reasons? All right, we want to hear from a young man. You're right. Come right up beside me. But I don't want any. What is this? Okay. All right. Tell us why you think some of the young people leave at that age. Because they might want to leave here because they might want to smoke ganja and drink rum and they want to have their own way. It sounds harsh, but it is true. They want to go and seek out other types of pleasure. And that's not really very nice, but it happens. You know, as, and why, why that magic age, 18, what is happening at that time? What is happening? How they get to leave? Why they never leave when they were 12? They're managing themselves at that time. The parents not watching everything that they do. And so it becomes more taxing. And they want to try out life for themselves. Some of them even want to live on their own at 18. Some of them become parents, teenage parents, at that age. And so what we're saying today is that we want to harvest the family. And I want you to remember that that was the first institution that God made the family. The very first. There wasn't any church in that whole Genesis beginning of the story. He started with the family. And that's because he knows that's a very powerful unit. And what are some of the benefits of 
being in a family where you can harvest church, where you can harvest the whole Christian thing? What are some of the benefits? How do you think it makes it easy? Being in a family and serving God as a family. And what are some of the things we can do? Again, come Mr. Brightman. I'm not going to, to, to forsake you. All I don't want you to be eating the tambourine right now, okay? <laughs> okay. So, being a part of a family and praising God is necessary because if you praise God more and more, God will bless you and give you a miracle and and he can make your life become better. He can change your life from bec becoming better because if you are having struggles right now, God will make a miracle and make you get a better life. Wow, what a bright boy. What a bright yeah, That's why he puts up his hand. So adults, don't let the little children beat you. The Bible says a little child shall lead. But if the child leads, I need somebody to follow. All right? So I want to hear from you now. Tell me, why is it a good thing, an easier thing to harvest within the family? How many of you grew up in a Christian family? One, two, three. All right, Sister Pam, you can tell me. And I need you to use the mic because we are going on the social media. Just come quickly, just like how he came up, nice and bright. A, big, a bigger child right now. <laughs> Praise the Lord, saints. Okay, so growing up in a Christian family, there is support where spirituality is concerned. There is a spiritual atmosphere. Like in my home, we have... Um, devotions every Sunday morning. That's where we learn to, not, yeah, every Sunday morning in my mother's bedroom, that's where we learn to pray. You are given the opportunity to pray. You are taught, taught the word of God. And the things that you do in the home, they are Christian based or God based. Um, base. So there are certain words you don't use, there are certain songs you don't sing, there are certain things you don't do. And if you, if you try to go out of the way, then you have brothers and sisters and your parents who will guide you and get you back in line. So having that support and bond in the family allows each person to grow in the Lord and grow spiritually and that helps you even as an adult because you will ha would have had a good foundation from your childhood and even in your home. Wonderful. Brother Adrian is coming. We're talking about the family. How is it we can harvest easier when we're in a family setting? What are some of the benefits that we can get being in a Christian family? Staying together, working together. And Miss Pam pointed out to family prayer. Remember the popular saying that goes the family that prays together, stays together. And I believe that if you are in a Christian home, you should pray together even once per week. And also, you should teach the children to pray on their own. But even once a week, it is a good thing to come together. I remember when we used to have family prayer in our home. And every time, Jan would say, my, my, it's time for the lecture. <laughs> and of course, that was a very sarcastic statement because he thought that family prayer was just chiding. But we can have time to interact as we come together, especially if the children lead the way, just like how he led the way. What's your name? Brother Ennis, he says, actually put the brother before it. Isn't that wonderful? Clap him. He's really in the family. All right. Brother Adrian, tell us the benefits. What are some of the benefits of being in a Christian family and how we can harvest? You have to come up here and use the mic because you are on social media also. All right. All right. All right. So bless the Lord, everyone. All right. So um, for me, I understand that the family is one of the first units that was ever um, you know, created. I mean, 
Adam and Eve coming um, forth. And so we understand then that great families will make great churches. So the families then is um, the foundation. So once we have a family, as was said earlier, that prays together and stays together, then we will have great churches as well, right? Because the church is made up of families. So I do believe that having a strong family bond, you know, um, I myself would have grown up in um, a household where both mommy and daddy would help us to pray together, you know, and it has impacted my life in a very positive way. So I do believe then that there are truly benefits for that. I have a little brother myself, right, and I try to cultivate the attitude of, you know, praying in the mornings, you know, um, we have a little family WhatsApp group as well. You know, so we have to use technology in the right ways, you know. So um, I have a little WhatsApp group. So every morning, mama would send something, good morning, family. And it's just a few of us. But it just, it just makes that bond even little, a little bit more closer. You know, so we'll have different chats in there, you know, little videos, and we we'll send it forth and have that bond going. So even though my sister is in another parish or somewhere or else, we can still pray for each other. So if anything is happening, you know, we can still keep that connect, um, that bond with each other. So families, I would recommend that, you know, even in your own little spaces, if you can make a little group, man, that has all the families, mommy, daddy, and, you know, the children, have a little family group, it can really help in you staying together, praying together, and you'll see that it makes a whole, a whole big difference as you even matriculate into the church as a whole. You know, so when you have great families, the church, we can come together and worship together, and it's such a beautiful thing to see families in church, you know, um, worshiping together, and it makes such a wonderful church that we can go forward. Amen. So God bless you in Jesus' name. Thank you. Wonderful, wonderful. I wonder if his brother could come up and tell me something about being in a Christian family. Come and tell me now. This is his little brother. I'm calling upon him suddenly. Tell me, do you like being in a Christian family? How has it helped you? Tell me what are some of the benefits. So the benefits is, so, you know, like my parents has been been Christians for a long time, so me as a young Christian, I can learn from them because they have made their mistakes, and so that provides me with the solutions to my problems, so I don't have to go through, you know, most of those things. So experience and learning from them. Of course, so things like priority and so, like, if um, instead of playing games and such, I can be reading my Bible and improving in the Word instead of social media and stuff like that. So, avoid distractions. Uh, oh, so, my name is Daniel McCallum. This was Daniel, little Daniel, the little brother of Adrian, and they work together as a team. Very lovely family in the Withorn Church. Praise God. When I went there, he was a newborn baby, and I saw him growing. He was in his mother's arms when I went to Withorn about 15 years ago. It's going up to 16 years now. How old are you now, Daniel? 17. Right. So, right on spot there. I know you have said a lot, but I'm still going to allow you. Come right up and tell us how you feel being in a Christian home. How I feel being in a Christian home is because I can learn more about Jesus and the Bible so that I can be saved with my Lord Jesus Christ who died for me on the old rugged cross and wear the authority cross that I was supposed to wear. But he said he would take the blame and I'm going to thank him this day for sparing on my another day and another life for me. Isn't that wonderful? So he's learning a lot just by being in a Christian family. And so I'm encouraging, before I hand over to Doc, I'm encouraging everybody. Mother, I still want to hear from you before I sit. I'm encouraging everybody, those who are in a family, you can teach 
your family members to grow in the Lord. Because if you don't teach them, they are going to find other teachers. Some of them might be very out of order on social media, you know, and they just select. But children need boundaries. They need an example to follow because Jesus came to earth. And I think Jesus came to earth really to be an example that if I can do it, you can do it too because he was flesh even though he was God. He was flesh and he's saying you can go through also. And so this is very important. So I'm calling on Evangelist Williams right now to tell us. She's a mother of a church. I'd like you to just tell us some of the benefits of growing up in a Christian home and how we can maximize that benefit. We praise the Lord. We praise the Lord. Praise the Lord Jesus, giving God thanks for this privilege to be in the house of God, not to be standing here, no. <laughs> Bless the Lord. All right. As Christians growing up in a Christian home, well, my home wasn't such a Christian home because it was, dad wasn't saved then, back then, when I accepted the Lord, but he came in after. So I'm saying, um, but I was brought up in the church. I don't know who here, who, who, any of you here right now that was in Sister Fox class and that was the youngest set of kids that were here at that time in Sunday school. So I was in, that's where I started my Christian life. Amen. Learning about God and doing the things that God requires of us to do. Yes, we are not all what we are to be, but we learn as we go from day to day, step by step, stage by stage, because Rome wasn't built in a day, and we can't be made perfect in a day. So we make mistakes, but at the same time, we know what is right from what is wrong. We have been taught, and if we read the scriptures, which is very imperative that we do, then we know how we ought to live, how we ought to walk as children of God. Learning, you see, you learn from seeing, you learn from hearing, and you learn from examples. Those are the steps of learning. And we learn. So when we get older in the Lord, and in maturity, self, in yourself, then you know that the difference, the difference between the right and the wrong. And so parents teach us these things, and the school teachers teach us these things. From the pulpit, we learn these things. So then when we understand, we know how to do it. Amen. So we grow from day to day, and we learn how to trust God more than anything else. Because when we hear and when we read and when we see what we ought to do, then we learn how to trust God and believe God. And that's imperative that we believe God. Most importantly, as children of God, as people of God, as children want to make it into God's eternal kingdom, we have to learn all these things. And we have to practice them, do them. Because the scripture tells me, and I oftentimes repeat this scripture, it's, it's not only to hear the word. It's good to hear the word, but most importantly is to be doers of the word. So if we hear the word and we're not using them to apply them to our lives, then what's the use? What, what are we getting out of it? So we need to do that. And that's all I have to say today. God bless you. In Jesus' name. Thank you so much, Evangelist. Well, I'm going to be asking three people to tell me about one family each in the Bible. Tell me about a family in the Bible that you, it, it resonates with you. Whether it is a good family or you think it's not so good. I want to hear what that family, how that family impacts your life. And of course, I'm seeing the same hands again and I'm not going to forbid. So come and lead the way. Tell me about one family in the Bible.
Mary and Joseph. The reason why I picked Mary and Joseph is because they had give a uh, give a uh, baby that was called Jesus, and that same Jesus changed my life because he Jesus is is the savior and the honorable God. Satan, he's just want to destroy us, but Jesus is going to cover us under his blood. And I know that Jesus will never forsake us or leave us because he's our savior, our almighty God. He should get all the honor and praise. Satan will be destroyed in the day of judgment. So you guys, you just have to believe in God and you will be saved from, from Satan because Jesus is going to carry you up to heaven and you will have eternal life. Definitely he has the story right. Okay, can I get another? Now that the little one has led us. I see these adults looking shy. <laughs> Nobody else wants to tell us. All right, you come and tell us. Put your hands together. Coming from Kensington. All right, Sister Noble, Missionary Noble. Praise the Lord. Greetings, everyone. Uh, speaking about family, I think about Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. And we will look at it and we will say, we supposed to be good family, love each other, take care of each other. But on the other side, we realize then that Miriam, you know, he, he wasn't such a, such a loving part of the family then to me, you know, because he, I would say envy Moses then. And he speak against Moses. And because of that, the Lord work upon her. My thought in Jesus' name. Okay. Work upon her, not mean elevate her. Put her down. Give her sickness. She has to stay outside of the camp for seven years before she could come in. And because of the goodness of Moses, he's the same one that he speak against, come back and ask for pardon for her. Come on. That, was, that ending was very necessary. Put your hands together. Let's hear so who was Miriam to Moses? She was the sister of Moses. What was her talent? What was her function? I will say in the church, even though it was not called the church in those days. In the family unit of worship, how do you describe Miriam? What, what was her role? Miriam. Yes, yeah, she was the one that brought the music. You remember she used the timbrel? And uh, we call it tambourine, still call it timbrel. But there is a place for every member of the family. Moses was the big prophet. But probably he couldn't sing as well as his sister. So she had a part to play. And who was the brother of Moses and Miriam? You remember? She called his name. Aaron was the brother. And what do you know about Aaron in the family business? Tell me what was the function. Because Moses felt a little intimidated for a particular reason. And then the Lord said, well, you have Aaron. So tell me, how did Aaron help? All right, Doc. Come, we have to get you on the mic because of the people on social media. They have to hear what we are saying. I have people as far as England watching now. Greetings, Pastor Trout and congregation. All right. Praise the Lord. So Moses was a bit intimidated because he had a speech impediment. And so Aaron was the articulate one. So God chose Aaron to, as it were, be a spokesperson for him. All right. You can still clap. This is family affair. Praise God. That's wonderful. So you can have a Christian family that ministers to the people. All right? And they work as a team. And if Moses was such a great prophet, 
Can you imagine? He couldn't speak. He thought that he was not articulate enough. Whether he stammered, I don't know. Whether he just didn't have his grammar together. But he needed his brother Aaron to spread the word. And so sometimes it is very good when you can work as a family. I'm from a family with nine of us. And we had job descriptions, each of us different, even to keep the house. We all had our parts to do. And so I grew up with this feeling that teamwork makes the dream work. You are supposed to know that I love that saying no. And so in a family, you can make your team work. One can be the one that brings the word. One can read the scripture. One can sing. You can even get a singing album, a singing group out of your family. God has equipped us. And he expects us to serve in that capacity. All right? And I think the example of Moses was excellent. And of course, I think the example of Mary and Joseph was very good also. Very, very, very. You couldn't get a better example where Mary and Joseph. You remember Joseph was seen as the earthly father, although he was not the one that planted the seed. But he still embraced his wife when they became. He was not ashamed of her, although he had to put her away because of what people would say, seeing her getting bigger and bigger pregnant. And in those days, you know, it was a bigger, bigger shame. So he was such a great husband and fiancé or whatever to marry. So as a family... We have to help one another, protect them from danger, protect them from gossip. Even gossip you have to protect your family members from. And so I'm from a family of nine and we keep ourselves together where one falls in whatever way. And it's not just one way you can fall. It's not just fornication. You can fall in many traps whether financial, whatever. But as a family, you are to grow as a bonded group. A bonded group. I'm a, I'm a justice of the peace, and I am sick and tired to go in the courts and see family squabbles fighting over land that the parents dead leave for them. And parents, you have a responsibility to leave your legacy properly. How many of you have a will? Oh, how many of you have a will? Let me see. Put your hands up. You have a will? You see that? That is important. He's saying, what is that? You don't ready for a will yet. <laughs> he said, what is that? Right. But adults, from your start to work, you should have a will. From your start. Because from your start to work, you have something. And you need to put your thoughts together. Don't leave everything for your children to fight and kill one another when you are gone. And you don't have to die when you are 80 and 90. We can have an accident. Anything can happen. So once you have even a car, you need to put it on the wheel. Who is to get it? Or if they're going to sell the one car and share. But don't wait for you to die. And then there is fighting in the family. Let's do everything together decently and in order. So before I hand over to Doc, is there anybody who wants to tell us just one more family and tell us how you have learned from them? Just one more. I will, I'm not going to give you another chance. Please, somebody else. He's crying. From a male perspective, he's saying, Yes, I'm just thinking about the family of Joseph, right, um, and the, the lesson of forgiveness. So as we know, what happened with Joseph, um, young Joseph coming up, very gifted, and then his brothers got jealous, you know, and so we understand, it. even the family, sometimes our sisters, our brothers will get jealous of, you know, you being a gifted person. So, you know, but and I'm thinking about it, I'm comparing that to even my family, and I'm thinking that there were things that my sister could do that I couldn't do. But I didn't get jealous of her. I, I'll just use that as something to say, if I can't do this, then let's work together. Right? But then there are families who they'll get jealous and you know, at the end of the day, we see where 
Joseph became second in command of Egypt and then ended up having to forgive his brothers, you know, for what had happened. You know, so there are things we can learn, you know, from that, that, you know, instead of being jealous of your brother, work with the brother, man, or your sister, you know, and maybe, um, you know, the end would be different than how it might turn out to be. I just to... And how could we finish this without talking about Joseph? That's a very, very good example. Can you imagine having 11 brothers? And uh, um, at that time, it was about 10 before Benjamin. Yes, and they all turned against him and, all, and plotted to put him to death. Their own brother. And the big brother said, well, let's not put him to death. Let's just throw him in the pits. And even that was bad, but it was better than putting him to death. Maybe Reuben felt that he could get off some way. But the best part of that lesson is that even after they were so cruel to their little brother Joseph, even though they did such a horrible thing, Joseph was put in command, as he said, second in command. And he could have just wiped them out. That's what most of us would do, talk the truth. Would, wouldn't, isn't it what you would say, I get a chance to show him a sauce? I think that's exactly what most of us would do, to be very honest. That's human. If we never had the Bible as an example, perhaps, Sister Pam is saying, perhaps everybody would say, after you so wicked to me, I go show you a sauce. But, everybody say, but. But God, and God in your life can make you love the person who is difficult to love. No big thing to love somebody who is easy to love. That's just normal. But when you love somebody who is difficult to love, somebody who treats you so bad that every time you see them, you want to cut your eye, you want to quinge up your nose. That's when we know that Christ was born in you. That makes a difference. That's what makes the difference. And so even family members, we have our fights, we have our quarrels, we have our stuff, but the Bible said, let not the sun go down on your wrath. So you may get angry, with each other, but don't let the night come and you go to bed with a heavy heart. All right? Let's try and make it up. I want you to put your hands together for all those who participated in this family discussion. And all at right at this time, I'm going to be handing over to our main facilitator, Doc. Um, I'm going to ask Dr. Bryant to come right now. Won't bother to let you stand, but I want you to give her a clap right now. That's Dr. Donnett Bryant, and she is the coordinator for the couples, but we're talking to all forms of relationship. Happy to have you with us, Bishop. Yes, sir, it's family day, and we might be a little different, even playing a ring game in church. But we have to get the family to work together. And as a family, we do things a little differently. All right? As long as we are not desecrating the temple. God bless you. Thank you, Sister Julia. Bless the Lord, everybody. Bless the Lord, everybody. Come on, let's stand on our feet at this time. We're just going to sing one lively chorus. And I'm going to ask everybody that's in the back to come up a little Closer, please. Come closer. Come closer. Let's huddle like families do. Bishop, you want to come up here and probably be in the same row as evangelists? Praise God. Just, let's huddle together. We're a family. Praise God. As much of you as can be in the middle, just come over to the middle. We're going to sing this lively chorus. God is good. God is good. God is good to me. How can I let him down? How can I let him down? How can I let him down? He's so good to me. Everybody sing, God is good. 
God is good. God is good to me. How can I let him down? How can I let him down? How can I let him down? He's so good to me. Don't you know that he picked me up? He turned me around. Plant my feet on solid ground. How can I let him down? How can I let him down? He's so good to me. If the Lord's been good to you, shout hallelujah. hallelujah. Glory to God. You may be seated. We give God thanks for the lovely way that Sister Juliet has um, facilitated the program so far. We've kind of uh, made some changes. So just trying to figure out how best we go about. Originally, the idea is that we would break up into groups um, of three. Really, we wanted families. But as you are now, I just want you to form three groups and we're going to cut down to just one of the activities because we've actually done one already, which would have been the question and answer section. So we're going to be doing a quiz at this time and there's a prize for the person who gets most of the points or the group that gets most of the points. So just put yourself in groups of threes and essentially this quiz is going to be based on biblical teachings and talks about figures related to our theme of embracing the spiritual harvest as families. We're not going to be long with this quiz because I just want to go into a, a little mini presentation. No, three teams. Three teams. Yes, you can't even name yourself. Choose an, a family name in the Bible. And call yourself that. Identify yourself. Three groups. I'm seeing two groups. Identify a group leader. And the group leader will come up here and collect. Group leader, please step forward from each group. All right, so that's one group. Stay where nobody can hear you, you know. All right. So you're the group leader. Clapper, Sister Pam is the group leader. For what's the name of your group? All right. Joseph. Can somebody in the group tell me why you chose Joseph? Other than the fact that Minister McCallum said it. Amen. Very important attributes for a family. All right. To exemplify. All right. Next group leader. Who's the group leader over here? All right, so group leader, what's the name of your group? Huh? Ruth. And why is your group called Ruth? She needs a mic. Wait for the mic, sis. Amen to that. She wise and she we didn't hear it. Say it on the mic. She, she was wise and she looked a rich man to marry. All right. <laughs> I don't know if I should have given her the mic, but anyway. <laughs> Wisdom. Definitely something Wisdom, to emulate. Yeah. All right. All right. Next group. Please come and collect your paper. Third group. The third group. Quickly, quickly, quickly. Clap her as she comes. This is a group leader. What's the name of your group? Give her the mic. It's over there. Quickly. What's the name of your group? Speak in the mic. It's not on. 
She said Daniel. Daniel. And can you tell us why? Someone from the group, please tell us why Daniel is a fitting group, fitting name for this family group. You've heard of my mic's not on. All right, she says Daniel went through a lot and as yeah. families, yes, we're yeah. going through a lot. And yeah. there are other people in the Bible who went through a lot, but it, they you, didn't really set a good example for us. So why Daniel? What does he exemplify? Because he was a determined person. Okay. Yeah. That's right. He, yes. he, he already had made up in his mind that whether he perished in the fire or whatever it is, he was not going to bow to any other God. God. He was going to serve his and do what his God said. Amen. It's a determination that we must have as a family. Who was it that said, as for me and my house, we will serve, we the, Lord. Will serve the Lord. Amen. All right. So we have our three groups. We have Joseph, Daniel, and Ruth. And it's so, no, it's not. I was going to say it's coincidental that the one group that has a female name has a male in it, but we see a male in each group. All right. So quickly then, there are only 10 questions. And as I said, they all exemplify either talking about embracing the harvest as a family or speaking about families in the Bible who exemplify evangelism, which is what it is about and what we're here to encourage you as families to get involved in today. All right, so the first question is, number one, write down your answers, you know, because you're going to turn them in. And the first group to reach up here with it, you'll get an extra point. So the first question, what did Jesus mean by the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few? In Matthew 9, verse 37. It's multiple choice, so you're only going to write A, B, C, or D. A, there are many crops to harvest. B, there are many people ready to hear the gospel, but few are sharing it. C, there is a lot of work to be done in the fields. D, the end times are near. Do not shout the answer out. Write it on your paper real quickly. I will not repeat. Please pay attention. Number two, in the parable of the sower, Matthew 13, verse 1 to 23, which soil represents those who hear the word and understand it, yielding a crop? A, pathway soil. B, rocky soil. C, the thorny soil. Or D, the good soil. So it's testing your ability to hear, process, and respond, right? We're not going to repeat. Three, which Old Testament figure is celebrated for her loyalty to her mother-in-law and eventually becomes part of the lineage of Jesus? Do not shout out the answer. Was it Esther? Was it Ruth? Was it Deborah? Or was it Sarah? We're on to question four. We're only doing ten. In Acts 16, whose family was baptized after he believed in God's word spoken by Paul and Silas? Was it A, the Philippian jailers? B, Cornelius's? C, Lydia's, or D, Aquila and Priscilla? Number five, what does Ephesians 6 verse 4 advise fathers to do? A, work tirelessly for their families. B, bring their children up in the training and instruction of the Lord. C, be the sole breadwinners of the family. D, make all the decisions for the household. It will be very interesting to see what you guys say for that one. In Proverbs 22, verse 6, 
what is promised as a result of training up a child in the way he should go? A, he will not depart from it when he is old. B, he will become wealthy and successful. C, he will always be healthy. And D, he will gain all the knowledge of the world. Seven, coming down. Which couple is mentioned in the New Testament as having a strong faith and hosting a church in their home? Was it A, Ananias and Sapphira? B, Aquila and Priscilla? C, Joseph and Mary? Or D, Zechariah and Elizabeth? Number eight, who think the quiz is easy? Let me see your hand. It's tricky five. <laughs> there are no trick questions. Number eight, how did Jesus demonstrate the importance of spiritual over biological ties in Mark 3, verse 33 to 35? So we must know the word. A, by teaching in the temple instead of staying with his family. B, by stating, whoever does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. C, by choosing 12 disciples to replace his family. D, by leaving his family to travel and preach. You can communicate it in your group. Right. See the school challenge vibe right there. <laughs> oh, this group, come. You guys need to work together. Work together. All right. Question nine. What role does Proverbs 31 suggest for a virtuous woman in her household? A, she's to be seen and not heard. She is responsible solely for cooking. That's B. C. She buys a field and plants a vineyard with her earnings. And D. She spends her time in leisure. It's not every answer you hear, bro, out, right? You know, so. <laughs> All right. Last question. Number 10, who in the New Testament is noted for her hospitality and is res resurrected by Peter, showing the early church's reliance on communal support? Was it Lydia? That's A. Was it B, Priscilla? Was it C, Tabitha, or, or Dorcas, some people may know her as, or was it Phoebe, Phoebe, that's D. All right, so that brings us to the end of the quiz. Clap yourselves, clap yourselves, everybody who tried. I want the three group leaders to bring the papers up here so there can be no more writing. Oh, yes, they will get an extra point. So we'll put a plus one on this. <laughs> the first one that brings up the answers. Okay, that's Joseph. This is Daniel. And then we're still waiting on... Ruth, and if we have to wait for more than 60 seconds, we're going to minus one. <laughs> da, 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 da. All right. <laughs> All right. Whoa. All right. Okay. So, while these points are being tallied, um, is there anybody here who didn't? Oh, I'll let Sister Juliet do that.
All right. So, well, actually, Sister Juliet, let me, let me have the key. Let me have the key. So we're just going to quickly say the answers while the points are being tallied. All right. So the first, what did Jesus mean by the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few in Matthew 9, 37. All those who said A, there are many crops to harvest. Let me see your hand. You see any A there, Sister Juliet? Did anybody say A? Did anybody say B? Did everybody say B? B is the correct answer. There are many people ready to hear the gospel, but few are sharing it. Clap yourselves. All right, everyone got that correct. Number two, in the parable of the sower, according to Matthew 13, 1 to 23, which soil represents those who hear the word and understand it, yielding a crop? Did everybody put the same answer? All right, so that would be the good soil, D. All right, clap yourselves. All right. Three, which Old Testament figure is celebrated for her loyalty to her mother-in-law and eventually becomes part of the lineage of Jesus? And we know that we have a group called Ruth. That's right. So that would be B. Did everybody have B? Excellent. All right. We're moving on. Number four. In Acts 16, whose family was baptized after believing God's word spoken by Paul and Silas? Who is that? Can anybody tell me? Say it, say it, say it. The Philippian jailer's family. Did everybody get that right, Sister Juliet? That is A. Answer A. One person got it incorrect. And that group, you know who you are. <laughs> what was their answer? <laughs> D. Aquila and Priscilla. All right, that group. You have to get up and tell me who was Aquila and Priscilla. Let's just, let's just sort this out here. So we don't have this happening again. Which group was that? That group needs to stand up and tell me who was Aquila and Priscilla. It was your group? <laughs> you know what happened over here? You weren't communicating. I'm sure there was somebody in that group that had the answer. So we learned something from that. You have to huddle. All right? Teamwork makes the dream work. Anybody can tell, what, tell, that, tell the group Ruth who Aquila and Priscilla was. Yeah, they were a couple. What, what was anything special about them? What was their occupation? They were, what did they make? Tent makers, yes, yes. All right, all right, okay. So the next question, number five, what does Ephesians 6 verse 4 advise fathers to do? Um, the one about... Do they work tirelessly for the family? I thought the answers were interesting. Aren't fathers supposed to work for the family? Are they supposed to work tirelessly? <laughs> All right. Bring their children up in the training and instruction of the Lord. So when you have questions like this, what you, what you focus on is the fact that they're asking you to give the answer that is related to the scripture that is mentioned, all right? So it's not in general. Even though the, this, the answer may be correct, it's a criterion that we expect of fathers. If that's not what's highlighted in Ephesians 6, 4, then that's not the correct answer. All right, so in this instant, the answer is B, bring their children up in the training and admonition of the Lord. Fear and admonition or training and instruction of the Lord. All right, number six. In Proverbs 22, verse 6, what is promised as a result of training up a child in the way he should go? So that would be A. Everybody got that, right? All right. And number seven. Which couple is mentioned in the New Testament as having a strong faith and hosting a church in their home? Yes, that's your time now. Aquila and Priscilla. That's right. Clap yourselves, clap yourselves, clap yourselves. Huh? Okay, that would be B, B, B. All right. How, did anybody get it incorrect? 
One said C. C was, let's see who it is. Let's see what. C was Mary and Joseph. Mary and Joseph hosted church in their home? No. I won't ask you who was Mary and Joseph because I know you know. All right. Um, number eight. How did Jesus demonstrate the importance of spiritual over biological ties in Mark 3, verse 33 to 35? How did Jesus demonstrate the importance of spiritual over biological ties? So this is all about understanding that, listen, as brothers and sisters in the Lord, in the Bible, Jesus demonstrated at some point that he understood his lineage and his spiritual heritage and that that actually took preeminence over his, if you can call it, biological ties. Right? So something that sometimes even here on earth we, we, we struggle to to deal with and come to grips with. And sometimes we have to make some decisions that reflect that order of priority. All right, so the answer to that question is B. Yes, by stating, whosoever does God's will is my brother and sister and mother, not necessarily whom shares my DNA. All right. Number nine coming down. What role does Proverbs 31 suggest for a virtuous woman in her household? And the answer would be C. She buys a field and plants a vineyard with her earnings. All right. And the last question, who in the New Testament is noted for her hospitality and is resurrected by Peter, showing the early church's reliance on communal support? Two names. Give me any one of them. Huh? Dorcas or Tabitha. Tabitha. Tabitha or Dorcas. Lydia was who? Was that the seller of purple? Right. All right. That would be C. C, yes. That would be C. All right. So while those points are being, being added up, did anybody get 10 out of 10? Nobody got all right? With the bonus. <laughs> and you're just assuming you're the one that got nine over here. <laughs> All right. All right. So while Sister Juliet is. All right. Clap them. Stand up. Everybody in Joseph. The winner. Joseph. Clap them. Clap them. Come on. This is one thing. We have to encourage within families. We have to be glad for each other. Amen. Even though they have now isolated themselves as Joseph. We are one big family in here. So let us rejoice. A win for Joseph is a win for everybody. Clap them. Come on. All right. Praise God. All right. So as I was saying earlier, we are looking at families embracing the harvest as we prepare for the coming of the Lord. Brother B. Yes. Thank you very much. I'm just going to whip through this little mini presentation with you really quick. All right, uh, before we get back to just one last thing, time is, is, is slipping away from us. But we, I don't want you to leave here without, you know, just reaffirming certain things and um, solidifying them, this understanding that we should have. The time that we're in, the last days. I mean, look, who heard about the earthquake in New York this morning? Yes, even though it was a magnitude four point something, a magnitude a little higher than that in a place as congested as New York City could have been seriously catastrophic. And, you know, we haven't really heard of quakes in that region in a while. So this is a little troubling that even though it's just a four point something, it's a bit concerning. And, um, you know, we have to look at all the bridges that are there. Now they're going to have to check on all the integrity. But the point is 
that earth, nature itself, we can see the anger rising up. We know the time that we're in and that we don't have much time. And we learned all of this week, all the speakers came and spoke to you from this very same scripture here, Matthew 9, 37 to 38. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his field. This is something that has been happening for quite some time. A shortage of labor. But now that we are so close to the harvest, in fact, we learned on Wednesday night, the harvest is actually ripe and some of the harvest seem to be getting rotten. So we are way past the time that the reapers should be out there in full force. Amen. Well, what role does the family play in all of this is really what we're looking at today, right? So we know that harvest in a, in a spiritual context. Can you put up the um, meaning of harvest for me? In the spiritual context, it refers to the process of reaching out to and gathering individuals who are ready to accept and follow the teachings of Jesus Christ, leading them towards salvation. And there are many scriptures that encourage us to do this. Each one of us here is an evangelist. Each one of us got that great commission. It wasn't given to just one particular person. Amen. But we have all been instructed to go out and to teach and to reach and to preach. Amen. We have been empowered with the Holy Spirit. We don't have to wait for a title to go out there. You, little man, you're an evangelist. And right there in his classroom, just by sharing the way he shared it a while ago, he can turn someone's heart for Jesus. He understands the fullness of what Christ did on the cross for us. And that's, that's the whole essence of the gospel. This is where redemption plan lies. It's all about what Jesus did on the cross for us. Amen. And it's for us not to sit down with that, but go out there and teach. So how as a family can we fulfill this mandate, right? So the family plays a pivotal role in the spiritual endeavor of the harvest by, first of all, it serves as the primary environment for nurturing our faith. You heard a lot of people come up here earlier on and they spoke about what happens in their family. Sister Pam said on Sunday morning, they had devotion so we know that that was where it was inculcated in her that, look, when you get up in the morning, put God first. Approach him. Let him be in charge of the day. Right, Bishop? And it's very important that we understand the environment then that we should have in our homes so that we can start out. Because, listen, if it's not right in the home, you know, when you go out, you're not going to be as effective as you should be. All right? Bishop cannot leave from his home after treating Sister Juliet any way he likes and come up in here and expect to reach people in the way that he ought. Amen? So he has a primary responsibility in his home, which I know he's living up to, thank God. Uh, we see it in the fruit, right? When you have, when it, the, the Bible, we spoke about it just a while ago. Train up a child in the way that they should go. And when they're old, what happened? All right. I know some of you are thinking in your mind, but I know I train up my child in the way that they should go. And they still went away. Not so, Bishop. But that happens, right? So what is this? What is the scripture saying here? Is, this, is the scripture not telling the truth? Of course it is. Of course it is. This seed is what we are to plant. Amen? There is seed time, there is harvest. So we are being instructed during that seed time, while they're in our home, plant that seed, Bishop. Plant it. You don't be concerned about the increase. Who brings the increase? Amen. But if you don't plant, can there be an increase? All right. So let us do our job in our home, have the right environment, plant the seed and make sure that the environment is such that the seed will thrive while it is in our home. So fathers, don't provoke your children to wrath. Don't burn them more than you should. Don't expect 
expect of them more than God is expecting of them. Amen. And make sure that you're living in front of them a life that they can exemplify. And they're not just going to decide to pray because you tell them to pray, but they see you when you go into your closet. Amen. Praise God. All right. So we're going to teach and we're going to, we're going to demonstrate the love and teachings of Christ through our daily life. And the third, which is very important for what we're looking at, is that we're going to actively participate in evangelism together. All right? So when we look at teaching and living the faith, we already mentioned that family is the first place that served then as a, a place where the gospel is shared and lived out. We can have our family devotions. We come to church together. We worship together. We pray together, etc. Prayer is critical. Family prayer is critical. I don't know about your home, but in my home, we, we have a devotion every night, right? But let me tell you something. Even though we have it as a practice, every single night, there is still like a challenge to make it happen. Am I the only one that experienced that? Huh? The enemy does not want this to happen. And we have to push beyond. Sometimes it's almost, it almost feels as if it has become ritualistic. You know? But you know what I say to myself in those times? Even if it feels like it is a ritual, we're going to do it. Because if, uh, if, we plant, if we allow that seed to come into our mind, that say, well, no, dude, this is just a ritual. And then we stop doing it. Who gets the victory? And we don't, we're not going to allow that, right? So we keep doing it until we know and we feel that it makes a difference and we begin to see the transforming work in our lives. Amen? Just as we treat it personally, so it is that it ought to be for our families when we get together. Amen? So remember, as Sir Juliet had pointed out, a family that prays together stays together. And we have a job. One, we're going to pray for those who are unsaved. Some of us, we have families. Some are in the church. Some are not in the church. And sometimes for years, you know, some of us, we feel comfortable just coming to church. The set that come to church and know that there's a set out there that not coming to church. We have to keep that burden on our hearts. We have to keep praying for them. We have to keep encouraging them. Some people feel like they can't evangelize to their family, you know. You know that, right? But you know why some people feel that way, though? Because of how they treat their family. Because of how they deal with their family. Because they have one face that, they, that we see here at church. And then there's another persona that their blood family is aware of. Right? And so as a, as a result, it affects their witnessing capacity. So when we're talking about reaching the harvest and evangelize, I don't want us to overlook the unsaved within our own family. Don't give up on them. Don't leave anybody behind. Keep reaching them. Keep encouraging them to come up. Some of them have been baptized in the church. Some of them even got the Holy Ghost and they're fallen soldiers. Reach out to them. Sometimes when we, don't, we don't call out to them. You know, We don't say, wait, what happened, man? We just not coming to church. They feel a little complacent. You know, Well, they're not bothering me, so I'm all right. So please... Remember our brothers and sisters, our blood brothers and sisters who are not in the way that we're to reach them. All right. And then, of course, our community at large. All right. So right at this point, I want to ask three persons just to share a story or a testimony. Um, I need to hear um, families who have seen transformation in their communities as a result of their active involvement in evangelism. I'm going to start with Bishop. Bishop, just give us one testimony of a transformation that you have seen in your community as a result of your family being involved in evangelism. And while Bishop is talking, I want the other person to think. So, Julie, is there another mic? All right. Bishop, I wouldn't mind if you come here because the people on live stream want to see you, sir. Sorry. 
So he's going to share with us just one, just one testimony of how transformation took place in his community as a result of his family's active involvement in evangelism. Yes, church family, biological family, family. Praise the Lord. Praise, praise the Lord, Lord, sir. Praise the Lord. Let me first of all greet Evangelist Paul and each and every one in the precious name of Jesus. Praise the Lord. Today we are talking about family and what we can do in our community. Um, I refer to recently, just recently, something happened in my community. My daughter was in the community and she saw a little girl coming from school. Her uniform was not looking good. The shoes she had on and she called the little girl and said, let me tie your shoes lace. And she tied her shoes lace and then questioned the little girl, where do you live? And she took her to her home. When she saw where the little girl lived, My God. and it's a f family, a group of them. They didn't have any mother. The mother was away, gone. And the responsibility is on the father. So I was downtown that day, and she called me. And when I answered, she said, we have a family to adopt. I said, what do you mean? She said, we have a family to adopt. So I leave from downtown and went up. And she told me what happened. And from ever, and she went and she began, it was coming on to school time. And she questioned all of them. And I was leaving about a week or two after my wife and I was going abroad. And when we went abroad, she called us and said, you have to carry clothes for this family. And from there, we, actually, we adopt that family. We sent them to school. One is now going to Claude McLeod in Dallas, Jen. Another one is going to a high school. And we adopt that family. We food, we get food for them. When we carry down food from abroad, she just called them and said, come and share for them. So right now, that family belongs to us. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. And from that, other people in the community is coming to us. See that? It's coming that to fire, us. fire, lit more fire. And from that, other people look at us differently. As a matter of fact, they are now calling on us and said there are a lot of sick people in our area. There are a lot of people who need help. And they are the last thing my daughter said to me that she is going to plan a healthier for the war food in Smithfield. Praise God, praise God, praise God. So when we call on you, the professionals, 
<laughs> Amen. When Amen. we call on you, the professionals, to come to war food, because then that my daughter is now saying to me, we have to we have a play field here, and we have to set up something there for the children. And the young boys, we have to stop them because I, I begin to organize a group for the young boys in the area that they can come on that play field. The, the play field is for the subdivision. But we, I, they come to me and I said, we are giving you the privilege, everybody in Warfield. Everybody can have the privilege, young boys, to go there, play your football, and but one thing, we are looking for discipline. And um, we are now in the process of, the, of even to form, to call in the police to form a youth club for them. Amen. So, and that comes from family. And, and so we now the extend, extend the family to everybody become our own family. That's right. Amen. God bless you. The, and that's what I think the church is for. That's right. That's what the church is for. Not to pass people. I don't care how they look. I don't care how they look. There were some of us as Christians past the sinners and not even how they do. We work some place and, and the people we work with don't know we are saved. And, and that's terrible. All right. God bless you all in Amen. Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Bishop. I mean, I, I don't even think I need to ask anybody else. I'm probably going to ask Sister Lenore real quick to say something because of the philanthropic spirit that I know she has always harbored so she can quickly say something about what her family has done for other families within the church. However, I think Bishop encompassed it all because he spoke about, first of all, this seed was born in his natural family. His daughter had an idea. And then when we looked after they took on the whole mission, it became something that addressed not just the physical needs of the target individuals, but now they, their spiritual needs can also be met because they now have entrance into the church. And at the end of the day, when we look, Jesus, he was so exemplary in this manner. When he would gather people together, he made sure that they had something to eat. Amen. Or it was that they got healed. A need that they had was met. And then salvation came along. Praise God. So it's an example that we can have of the life transforming work that can take place in our communities. But we, our church, the unit is the family. Likewise, the community, the unit is the family. So this is the common ground on which we stand. Don't feel pressured, Sister Lenore, but if you want to share... Real quickly, like two minutes. Two minutes. Everybody know. Everyone know that I'm a shy, shy, shy person. I'm surprised. <laughs> anyway. But he has given you the spirit. Not giving you the spirit of fear. Anyway. Go ahead. Yeah, you know, I come from a poor, poor family. My mom left me. My mom left me. I'm a Trini. My mom left me when I was six years old. And she left someone to take care of us. And then that person died. And then I had to go back to Tobago to stay with my grandmother. Anyway, they treated us like dog. Like, you know, everything my mom sent for us, they will they give it to their family. Anyway, I grew up with that. You know, I grew up that when I came to Canada, when I went to Canada, trust me, that hurt that came in, that I, I grew up with. I just love people. I just, if I see a kid, a child, True. that needs something because of my experience when no one didn't give anything, I will give that child. You know what? We have to experience things to know what to do. 
You know, like I tell you, I do so much because I just have love because I've been through a lot growing up. It's only when I went to Canada that I felt life. I know about life. And with that past experience how we grew up, like treated like a dog, I try to treat everybody with love. And if I can give, I give. Amen. So what we learn here is that a lot of times the experiences that we have is exactly what prepares us for the purpose that God has orchestrated for us. Amen. And so in that experience, she could have become bitter and decide that humanity is lost and nobody is good and I don't care. But she made the decision that, look, I don't want any other child to go through what I went through. And I can attest to the fact that her generosity knows no bounds. She's that person who, when she would come for convocation, literally with a full suitcase, she would go back with an empty one. Amen? Just give everything, including the clothes off her back. God bless you, Sister Lenore. May he continue to allow your cupboards to overflow so that you can bless others. So, all right, we've looked at stories of transformation, and we're going to go on to how do we prepare our families for the harvest, right? Um, because a lot of people want to go out there, they want to evangelize. A lot of people want to win souls, if I should say show of hands. Those of you who want to reach the community, let me see. Why well, I think every hand would just go real quick. Put them down again. So let me see the hands of those who want to reach the community for Christ. That's what I'm talking about. All right, so how do we prepare? One, we have to be spiritually ready. Right, Bishop? We, can't, we cannot just go there um, in our unregenerate state. That's the word, Sir Tracy? Right. Because we cannot help anybody further than where we are, you know. It speaks naturally and it speaks spiritually. All right? And I'm not saying that you need to, when I, say, when I speak of the natural, I'm not saying you have to be wealthy to help others. Because little is much when you place it in God's hand. And wealth doesn't necessarily mean money. It can just be your time that you offer. You go down to the infirmary and you spend time with individuals. You go into the schools, you volunteer your time. You come to the church and you volunteer your time. Cleaning, whatever it is. Give of yourself to the community and to the people of God. And to the unsaved out there. So many corners where you have the young men stand up. Rubbing out hand middle, smoking, doing what, you know, on Wednesday night you heard. Just the kind of addictions people are dealing with and just where uh, the depth that, you know, some people, the life, that, the, the depth of darkness that is enveloping them. And sometimes it's such that we probably cower and um, I don't want to use the word are afraid, but we're apprehensive about going into some of the places that we are required to go to do the work. But we have to understand that we're not going there alone, but we're going there in the power and the authority of Christ. And that's why I'm saying to you, you must be spiritually ready. You cannot go into territories and claim territories that you, number one, have not been sent. And number two, that you are not prepared to deal with. Um, and it doesn't mean that you must have a whole um, barrage of tongues in your arsenal. The word of God is sufficient. It doesn't need any help. You see, some people sometimes going to deal with people who are clearly under spiritual bondage. You know, and instead of just using the name and the authority of Jesus and sharing the word, the life transforming word with them, they decide that they're going to sprinkle water and say all the tie, 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 my bow tie, she becoming on a Honda, he becoming in a Hyundai and all of that. And sometimes the demons just look and laugh. So guys, you can fool each other because there are still some people among us who are impressed with their tongues. But you cannot fool God and you cannot fool the spiritual forces that are working within those people. They know when it's a genuine article evangelist. They know. Sometimes they announce it. You know, you heard that woman who was operating by the spirit of divination when the brethren were walking and preaching and she walking behind them and saying, these are men of the most high living God. They know it. They recognize God's people. And know the authentic. Amen. So we are going to be spiritually prepared for this harvest through 
regular Bible studies, we must know the word. When Jesus was in the wilderness and he was there for 40 days, 40 nights fasting and he came and the devil tempted him. He never used tongues. He never needed uh, any kind of all kind of antics. What did he use? Yes. Everything he said was preceded by it is written. So we can't shift no dimension. We can't change anything if we don't know the words. A basic thing. And so Tracy is a sad thing. But a lot of people don't know the word. Take your time. Sit at the feet of those who have studied. Take out your Bible. Don't be so quick to come and get this microphone. Sit down there and learn. Pay attention. Turn up for Bible study. And Sunday school. Right? Likewise, you must have an active prayer life. Lord of mercy, man. It's time to move beyond just saying, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And we know that that's a deep prayer and fine. It is actually an example and something that is a lot deeper than many of us know. It's, it's telling us different things if you go through the different steps. But when I'm talking about having an active prayer life with God, when you're in the car, when you're on the bus, when you're driving, before you make any transaction, before your foot hit the ground in the morning from off the bed, talk to the Lord. That's your friend. You can't keep malice with him. And then all of a sudden you're calling him now when trouble take you later on in the day. That's not how it works. That's not how it works with our natural friends, right? So it cannot work so with Jesus, the friend that sticks closer than any brother. You must have an active prayer life. I remember prayer is simply communication with God, and it goes two ways. Yes, we talk, but we also listen. listen. We must hear from God. You have people talking about, oh, I want to know the will of God, I want to know the will of God. But they're not taking the time to really stop and to listen. Now, number one, his will is outlined in his word. It never contradicts his word. Number two, he has spiritual fathers among us who can talk to us and encourage us in a particular way. But sometimes when we wake up in our mind that this is what we want to do, you know, we don't hear what God is saying. So let us learn to listen, not just with this, but right here, right? It's, it's, it is with the heart that we hear God. Amen? So Bible study, prayer, and fellowship. Ever since COVID, I don't know what happened, but a lot of people just tethered to the online movement alone. They don't have to come out anymore, or at least so they think. And so they're forsaking the fellowshipping of the saints as the manner of such is. Amen? We cannot afford for that to happen because... A lot of times you come in here, you might be burdened, you might be heavy, Sister Delmarie. But when you get here, a word hits you. Yes? And you feel the, the, the energy inside this place. Your burdens are lifted. It's totally different from if you're at home you know, and you cook while you're doing it. Yes. Or your husband in the background talking as well. Oh, you're yeah, not, you're not given. Yes. What, what is that, Sister? Okay, I was saying that if you're cooking and you're listening and the people making night, you hardly can focus and watch. There you go, go, focus. So we come into the house and we know that here we come for that one reason. Amen? And we leave everything else, all the trials, the bills, the children, fussing, all of that. We leave it behind and we come in here and we give God his due without any distraction. Amen? So some practical steps then. So that's preparation. Practical steps that we take as families, and I'm, I'm getting ready to get down, to get involved in missionary work, evangelism, and community service, right? What's missionary work? Huh? You know, that's one thing I never understand growing up. We have this position called missionaries. And I don't know if I can't say it here now, right? But we, we give people that title, missionaries, and you put on your white dress and you come to church. And everything that happens is here. But when I read in the Bible about missionaries, Paul and his missionary journey, we talk about people who sojourn, went far and everything. But you know, I, if I, when I was little, I heard the stories, right? In the early days, with Mother Watson and the bishop, you know, like Mother Watson literally could come, Sister Tracy, and said to this person, correct me if I'm wrong, Bishop, brother or sister, 
I need you to go to Balaclava. And they have to pack up and go. That is the mission. <laughs> you think we can do that now? <laughs> In Bishop, we can do it now? <laughs> huh? For a day, but not. <laughs> yeah, all right, tell me. Tell me why it may not be as practical. Mighty God of Daniel. So, Tracy, come on now. <laughs> you heard what you said? So, we have this mistaken notion, guys, and we have to understand that all of us are supposed to be missionaries. All right, so we understand the hierarchical. Um, what you call it, organization of this movement and, and roles and assigning titles and all of that. But I, I want you to grab a hold of the fact that this thing is personal, that everybody has been given this mandate. All right? So we are all missionaries. Missionary McCollum. Whether you, you know you can't put on a white dress, sir, but you are a missionary. Amen? Praise God. And by the same token, we are all evangelists. Right? We are all primarily evangelists. The moment we put on Jesus' name, the mandate becomes ours to go ye out into the world, teaching, preaching, telling everyone else, don't forget what I said. You can't go out there and tell anybody what you yourself have not learned. So it's not just, uh, it doesn't begin and end at Acts 2.38, which I find a lot of times, as apostolics, we tend to just have an arsenal of, what, three verses that we know and can rattle off. But then if we are asked to explain, well, why does it say so-and-so in Matthew 28, 19, we struggle. So it's up to everybody to ensure that you find whatever the source is, whoever can elucidate it for you. Read it if you don't understand it. Make sure you know what it is that you believe and you're not just following because that's what you grow, come and hear. Because then you're going to have a hard time convincing somebody in Jehovah's Witness that, look, listen, man, what you're dealing with is not the truth. It's not the truth. It's simply a cult. And you're not going to be able to tell them based on the word of God. So make sure that you know it. All right? And as Bishop pointed out, community service. Very important, right? Because we cannot just be isolated in these four walls and we come and we jump up and down and fire, fire, fire. And, but we don't business with anybody outside there. Then when we go out there to witness to them, they're going to be like, who are these strangers? Right? So we have to get involved. I love the relationship that we have with the people next door. If we never had that relationship with them, we would not have been able to use their lawn as a parking area. There probably would have been a big rift by now if we were showing them bad colors. Amen? So this is how we ought to be in our own communities. Make sure it's not such that the people who live next door to you, the, the, the way that you relate to them has completely marred your witness. It's sad. And some people actually feel justified in them. Me, the people are over there, so I know good people. Eh? Me, not, me not talk to them. How are you going to witness to them? Every day they get up and I'm play the old music, but blood for them. <laughs> you know? So we cannot have that approach, right? We have to. And God equips us, you know, sometimes. I don't know. I don't know where I get it. I don't know where I get it from. I'm going to say it's the Holy Spirit. But I have this thing where it doesn't matter what the person's approach, what they're going through, or they're whatever. I've never feel shy about going to speak to them or approaching them. And I don't think any of us need to because we're not going in our own power. So before I go there, I say, God, you have to prepare their heart. That is not my responsibility. You prepare their hearts. Give me the words to say, and I'm going to go and do your bidding. Amen. And that's the attitude that we should have. Let's not assess whether, Lord, them now go hear from me. Look, look how many look, and look how them look. Not the people that don't want to hear from me. No, that's not your responsibility. When God sends you somewhere, go do what he says. Amen? All right, so what are some of the challenges that we face as we um, attempt as families to evangelize? What are some of the common challenges that we might face embracing the harvest in this time? Anybody want to say any? Come on, I know you have it. 
All right. So there might be some time constraints. All right. Some people are in school studying, balancing school work, regular work, other responsibilities. So it makes the family feel so tied up with all that they have going on that they feel like they don't have the time for evangelism. But do you know how many of us know that that is the work of the enemy? That's one of the things. He wants to keep us distracted. So he floods our lives with all kinds of things. And if we're not careful and we don't prioritize and we don't know when to say no to certain things and put God's business at the position in the hierarchy that it ought to be, then you're going to find that we feel overwhelmed and we start toss, you know, God's business to the side. Right. So the key is balance. Go ahead. Our unsaved relatives, yes. Mm -hmm. That's right. They take the message on. That's right. And that's why it's so important to guard your integrity and your witness fiercely in your work environment and in your home. All right? Be such that you don't want, even though you are speaking the true word, that nobody is listening to what you're saying because they know who you are. There's a little saying, your actions are speaking so loudly that I cannot hear what you are saying. You get that? Yes. Your attitude, speaking so loudly that I cannot hear what you're saying. All right? So, yes? Somebody has a mic? Can let her have it? Because she's kind of far. From... Okay. I'm going to ask you to repeat on the mic because the people on live stream, they're not able to hear you unless you speak in the mic. Praise the Lord. Sometimes we discriminate. We make judgments about who can be saved or who will not be saved. And so we don't approach some people. Mm -hmm. And many times after we see them saved and sanctified, you say, oh my God, I didn't mm. know that one could be saved. My God. So we need to be careful about that. Right. Very good point. One of the ones that I was, uh, I was actually going to bring out, and it refers to cultural or social barriers. So we have cultural differences and norms, and we, we cannot be judgmental in our approach and assume that because this person is from a Hindu family and so deeply entrenched in that faith that they will not ever want to hear what you have to say. Those people are born pagans and, you know, they serve many gods and they will never listen to you with your monotheistic self. But we have to understand that um, it is God who will turn the heart. Right? Or Rastafarians, right? So whatever, those just understand that we, we are not subject to cultural norms in terms of we're not going to allow that to deter us from sharing the truth. We must be sensitive and understand the platform that we're going to step on, however, when we go to speak to people of different faith, etc. And being respectful is very important. And you gradually inch your way in. All right. So you don't just go with the Bible and start beat them over their heads, you know, with what you what you know. Amen. All right. So some people fear of rejection. Fear of rejection. So some people are concerned about, now we mentioned this before, the negative response that they, they might leave families feeling they have little, oops, negative responses from others can deter family members from sharing their faith openly. All right. Anybody here ever had that experience? Are you witness to somebody and they just, you know, they made it seem as if you were being overly aggressive with them or... Um, that happened to you? Really? At school? No, no, no. He, he put his hand up. What happened? Let me hear. That's interesting. Real quick. What happened to you? 
Tell us about how you shared, um, you tried to evangelize, and it was met with rejection. Okay. Can turn so, around and face. Turn around. Okay, so it was like I was telling my classmates that God is real and that God sh will save you someday, but you have to believe in him. But they said they didn't want to hear about that. They hardly have another God. And I said, what? They said, yes. And I said, what kind of God? They said they worship, they worship their money. And then they started to laugh at me and said, I worship a non-God. And that, that God that I worship is not real. So I got angry and told my teacher. But my teacher asked who did it, and I pointed it out. And, and teacher said that God, might, that God might not save you on the day of judgment because you are accusing him and mocking him that he is not real. And then I... Then he, then my classmate looked at me, and I smiled, and go back to my seat and said, "I told you, God is real." All right, so Tracy, help me here. Take the mic to her. Take the mic. Can you just real quickly tell us one way that you think the teacher could have responded? Do you think the teacher's response was entirely appropriate, or is there something else, another way that the teacher could have actually? Um, dealt with the situation, considering there are two individuals now that, you know, needed to be ministered to him who faced rejection in the midst of his attempt to share his faith, and then the other young man who, for some reason, was rejecting what he had to say. So it was a good opportunity for clarity, right? which he tried to do. And, you know, you can't... You can't diss people who are doing the best that they can do. That's right. That's her way. Right. But it would have been good to take both persons and to just, you know, have a conversation even to the rest of the class to determine, you know, the God that we ought to believe in, who he is. So it's a good opener. Right. And sometimes when negative things happen, don't use it as a door that has shut. Right. But rather use it as a door to open up some questions and answers that maybe if that did not happen, you wouldn't get a chance to expose. Amen. Exactly what I needed. Clapper, clapper. That's exactly what I wanted to be brought across. Let us not miss those teachable moments. All right. So there was an opportunity there to further confirm what he has to say. And listen, this is a liberty and a freedom and a privilege that we have here in Jamaica that we can have these discussions about our faith in the classroom. Most of the other countries in the world don't have that. Certainly those in the first world, absolutely not. You know, so I, as if you are in this room right now and you are as a teacher, don't miss those opportunities. All right? So... Um, for those people then who fear rejection, we look at 2 Timothy 1, verse 7. Can you put that up for me, sir? 2 Timothy 1, verse 7. No, 2 Timothy 1. There you go. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear. Repeat it. So we cannot walk in fear. We cannot go out there and evangelize in fear. Amen. We still have to make sure that we are approachable. We're not going out there to hammer down anything, anybody's throat, as people like to say, when they just really don't want to hear what you have to say. But we, there is a way to present it, but we have to make sure that we're not afraid. All right? Because God is with us, and he's the one who is giving us the power, the love, the self-control, all of those things that we need to be effective evangelists as families all right so families can as a family if you realize that for example him he had that experience and he may as a result of that become fearful some children become fearful after that to share because they don't want to go through that humiliation again 
So as families, it's good that we have an open relationship with our children, that they can come and share experiences like this, and we can pray with them and encourage them so that the spirit of fear does not overtake them and they will continue to witness. Amen? All right. So the next one, another, another um, challenge that we might face as families as we, we evangelize is differences in spiritual maturity. So different family members might be at a different stage in their faith journey. And so when we come together and we're trying to do things, we find, you know, if, if this is a family of that's an older couple and just a two-year-old or, well, let me not use two-year-old because let's use somebody who has been baptized as well. But they're young in the faith. All right, so we have to make sure that at home, we're training them up, we're reading the word, we're encouraging them, we're bringing them to Sunday school, we're preparing them so that later on, they're not 40 years old and still spiritually inept. All right, you have people who are 40 years old and they don't know any more Bible verses than somebody who is five. All right, and that is because of years of not studying the word. So I'm not impressed with your chronological age here today. That's not what we're talking about when we refer to spiritual maturity because we have some 80-year-old babes in the church. All right? We have to make sure that we're growing. Every year we celebrate a natural birthday. We should be able to also see spiritually some growth. You cannot be the same person spiritually that you were 10 years ago. Our God is a dynamic God. The Holy Spirit transforms us. So we don't stay the same way year in, year out. All right? We will not be able to join bands, join hands with the rest of the evangelism team if we are not able to pull our weight as well. All right? And 1 Corinthians 12, verse 4 to 6 tells us, Now there are diversities of gifts, but the same spirit. All right? Encouraging families basically to respect and to utilize the different spiritual gifts and maturity levels within their families. In our devotion, you know, my husband, because he's always the first one to start, he would come out and he would start the singing. And I said, no, 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 please let me do the singing. <laughs> That's, it's the truth I'm telling you. <laughs> we have to operate within <laughs> our particular gift and calling. Amen. We will, we will let you expand on the word. Let, let me just start the chorus. And thank God among our children, we have a few harmonizers as well. So we carry, we carry it and we carry him. And then he joins in at prayer time. And, I, and if he's listening, praise the Lord, Elder Bryant. I love you. All right. So um, another um, challenge that we face we spoke about that earlier, lack of knowledge or training. All right? So it's important that we engage in things like these, Bible study, Sunday school, personal family devotion, prayer time, all of the training grown. Flex our spiritual muscles so that we're ready. Because it's a battlefield out there, you know. It is a battlefield. When I am so afraid for teachers in the classroom today. It is a ripe harvest. It's a ripe harvest. Just the same way I view my practice. Every patient that come in there, I not only think about what's going on with them physically, but we're not going to end until we touch on the spiritual. And likewise, in the classroom, I imagine every morning, I, if I were a teacher, as when they're coming in, you know, I'd be there praying under my breath. Because not everybody's going to receive it the way, you know. Before they come in, you pray over your classroom, every desk, when the kids come in, Right, Sister Juliet? Yes. And you cover them, all right? Because you may be the only spiritual anchor, you know, or at least the first step and entrance into that development of that aspect of their lives. So let's not take it for granted. There's a reason God puts us in different spheres and places. And at the end of the day, we have to fulfill the purpose and the mandate for which we have been called. Um, so we dealt with what is the harvest? We looked at what are the, the, the roles of the family 
the pivotal roles that the family play. We looked at what are some of, some of the challenges that we face when it comes on to reaping the harvest. And then now we are looking at actionable strategies. All right, so we have to deal with daily devotions. We spoke about that. We need to dedicate time for daily devotions as family. I'm not trying to embarrass anybody. Let me just see a hand of those who have a dedicated time that you gather your family together for devotion. If it's even one time a week. This is a challenge. This is a challenge. Yes. Maybe, maybe some of you are here, but your family is not here with you. But if you are a representative in a family that does that. Let me see your hands. Praise God. And that's very important. Very important, brethren. Because the attacks are going to come from without. We don't want them within. We want the wall to be fortified. Amen? So let us ensure as of this day that we establish in our homes, that's where it begins. The responsibility cannot be placed entirely on the Sunday school teachers or worse yet the teachers out there in the secular um, school. Right? It begins at home. And if you're a single parent family, there's still no excuse. Do your best to train them up. All right? Amen. And while you're doing it, you know, you're strengthening yourself. Because as you grow, you're going to find these children ask some serious questions, you know, that challenge you and cause you to have to even go back and look up at certain things. All right? So daily devotionals, very important. We want them to be age and stage appropriate. So you're going to share according to the maturity level, spiritual and natural maturity level of all the members that are present. Amen? Bishop spoke to us earlier about community involvement. I want you to think as you get from here, what are things that you can do in your small community, right, to help. We, we here represent many, many different territories, many, many different communities. I know in the community of Old Road where our, our church stands, my God, when you look at one corner, Early Sunday morning, the men are out there already rubbing out the hands, already with their flasks. There's a church to the right, and then there's our church to the left. And sometimes it's such a, they, they, they're trying to turn their music up higher than, you know, the churches that are nearby. We can't, we can't operate in fear, but we have to do whatever is needed spiritually to, put, to tear down those strongholds in our communities. Amen. Don't be afraid of talking to these young men. It makes no sense that there are so many more women inside here and a handful of men when there are so many men on the street corner. So let us develop actionable strategies to reach them. We can, I believe your sister Juliet in the workers meeting, he mentioned, or I'm not sure, was it? No, it might have been the first presenter. He mentioned that one thing was impressed with a particular movement who had home Bible studies. And that's something, of course, that we can start. If your family is already strengthened in the word, you can invite other families within your community to come over to your home and you have home Bible studies. Many churches have been formed, have been planted, have been expanded as a result of home Bible studies. I'm not asking you to go behind your pastor's back and start another work. I'm asking you to do something that is endorsed by your pastor. Amen, because there are certain things and guidelines and teachings within which you need to operate when you begin to have those. And the church itself sometimes can have the resource material to share with you in terms of how to carry out a home Bible study. But it's very effective if you really want to reach the community. Amen? Amen. You, she's saying you can do it, technology. You can actually do it online and with your phone. Amen. You can have Zoom Bible studies as well. All right. Um, participating in community service. Sometimes we have the tendency as a church to just isolate ourselves. And we have our little inspiration. And we have convocation. And we have youth week. And we're just going from one church to the next, to the next, to the next. But how are we reaching the community? 
we have to engage in more activities that involve them. I like when I hear the roll call when we refer to them as the VIPs. They are the reason we have gathered together. We are here to reap the harvest. And we need the unsafe to know that they are more than welcome. That they are not intruding on something special that's just happening with us. But they need to come up. They are the guests of honor. We want them to be in here and to feel welcome. And to not leave the way that they came. Amen? Amen. Praise God. All right. So, um... Someone asked a question daily. I, um, I think when the person was preaching on, on, on Wednesday night, they were talking about all oh, places, you know, where we might have to go and some people that we might have to talk to. So I want to ask you the question. Um, are there some places that, you know, all right, let me, let me, let me be very, very frank. There was a, an entertainer. Um, she got baptized in Jesus' name. She was a well-known reggae artist. And she got baptized in, in Jesus' name, and she changed her name to minister something. And, and then after a while, I'm not sure what was happening, but at one point it was said that she was on the, the roll to sing again at um, the, reggae fest, the annual reggae festival. All right, so there are different school of, schools of thought surrounding that. Um, some people are saying by no means she should be on that platform ever again. And some are saying that she had a base or an audience with those persons. And then by her going in that realm and speaking now for Jesus, that lives can be changed. I want two people to give me some feedback on what you think about that. Starting with you, Sir Tracy. The mic, the mic, the mic. Praise the Lord. Praise everyone. the Lord. I don't know why people like to give me the hard questions. <laughs> um, the truth of the matter, you know, I'm going to tell you the truth. The truth of the matter is in situations like that, you have to be led completely by God. Your Holy Spirit within you, there is no set precedence as to how God is going to lead you and who he's going to lead you to. Um, that is one of the mistakes even the Pharisees made when Jesus came. They expected him to come in a form that they were accustomed to. They expected him to do what they think that he should do. The traditions spoke to their Messiah coming in a particular way. And that was, and it wasn't because they weren't good people. They were good people. They were looking for this Messiah for years. But when Jesus came, they couldn't recognize him. And it has been a cry of my heart for years now that I believe sincerely, and I say it without apology, and I hope nobody don't put me under the bridge. I believe within my heart that if Jesus were to come now, some of us would not see him. I to God. Because we have become so accustomed to what we believe Jesus should be and is, and what the whole that we we forget that God is bigger than us, sovereign. And so her going into an arena that she came out of may not seem, you know, like the right thing to do. And if we are to be honest, we are say, what kind of foolishness is that? But the truth of the matter is, if that is where God sent her to reach even one person in that audience. Who are we? Who are we to determine that this is not how it should go? Because if we go back to the scriptures, and if we really, you know, you said something about people reading and becoming mature. If you ever read some of the things that happened back in the day in the scripture, some oh, yes. of us would never be saved, but it's because we don't know our Bible. We God. don't know it. Help us, Jesus. So we make all sorts of assumptions as to how God should operate. My thinking is make sure 
especially if you are doing something controversial, make sure it's you. not just you being rebellious, but that it is God himself who sent you. And if it is God himself that sent you, he will get his reward and he will be glorified. Maybe you don't see it, but God knows why he does what he does and who he wants to do it through. Amen. That Amen. is peace. I believe Sister Juliet had a comment. Thank you, yes, Deacon. Thank you, Sister Tracy. I'm also speaking in reference to the same person. I remember when she got baptized. She was not accepted by the Apostolic Church. Mighty God. She was baptized at Emmanuel. My own brother was the person who baptized her. And a lot of skeptics were just saying, give her six months. Mm -mm. She now nah stay. She'll go back for the money. Mm -mm. And when you are rejected by God's people for becoming a Christian, it's a terrible thing. Who should she witness to? She can't go some church. They don't, they don't accept her, you know? And I think a lot of us are to blame for some of these things. Because who am I to say she could not be saved? You know? I remember when I, my brother had called me and showed me that she was being baptized on the screen. And the song that came to me immediately Chiefest of sinners. Jesus can save. Don't we sing that song? Yes. But I don't know if we believe it. I don't know if we believe that Jesus can save somebody like that woman until she feels alone sometimes. We have to look into ourselves because God is able. To save anybody. You are never too far for God to save you. But many of us are too skeptical. And will not receive our own brothers. You know. So that is another part that we need to look at. Yes. Very important. Bishop, did you want to weigh in real quick, sir? Before. Oh, yes. Sister Bev. And then you pass the mic to Bishop for me, please. Praise the Lord Jesus. Praise As Sister Gillette was saying, the um, you know, chief is a sinner. Um, they said the vilest offender who truly believe the moment from Jesus a pardon. A pardon receive. And if we listen to the preacher, um, um, Bishop Todd, you know, he said, um, to be salt, uh, you have to get near the people. You have to get, you know, so because um, if you're salt of the earth, I mean, how are you gonna? Um, you know, contaminate me if you stay away from me. I mean, this is her mandate. Um, you understand me? I think God had her for such a time as this to go out and reach her peers that many of us would not go. You know, places where persons are, um, you know, even these guys who rubbing their, um, you, you know, rubbing out their hand middle. You know, we need people. People need to find them, man. You know, find them, call them out of the room bar, call them out of certain places that we, they have been hiding. You know, as I said, we, um, um, God has not given us the spirit of fear. So, I mean, I big up that sister. Yeah, and your testimony has different weight in different places. Yes. So someone who has come from that environment certainly will have a greater audience right, to reach than someone the who never Amen. Has, has, has had that experience. When they look and they say, my God, if God turned you around, I remember what you used to do. I know what you were like. And if this is not, if you're now talking about a God who has now curbed that temper that you have, a God who has now helped you to get over that smoking addiction, a God who has now stopped you from going from house to house and bed to bed, you know, I can now relate. You were once a prostitute and God changed you. My God, he can change 
change me too. So oh, when we understand the testimony that we have and the weight that it bears in particular environment, then the onus is on us to go to reach back yes. and grab individuals. But I want you to remember exactly what Sister Tracy said. Listen, ensure that it is a mandate from God. All right? Because it could very well be that there are some people, because it, it became a little popular thing though, you know, to, for people to get converted, even in Hollywood. And so they started to have like a lot of celebrities that were coming to Christ. And a lot of them, before you know it, they were back to doing what they were doing. Well, how many of them had the experience, as Sister Juliet said, where they came and they never felt accepted? Or how many of them truthfully might have done it for a profit? There's this guy called Snoop Dogg, who, and that's another thing. It's popular after a while for them to make like a gospel album. And then to promote that gospel album, they pretend to have a conversion experience. And so he made a gospel album. And during that time, he was, you know, going to churches and, 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 and Christians were like, yeah. You know, Snoop, blah, blah, blah. And then the next year, guess what? He wanted to make a reggae album. So suddenly he decided, he, I think he actually came to Jamaica, met with some of the bubble shanty guys and thing, and had some big ritualistic experience. And all of a sudden he was Snoop Lion. And so that authenticated the music that he was creating. So we know that some people are not serious. You know, but guess what? We are not the Lord of the harvest. We are here to encourage all who will cause some people. They're going to get up. They're going to drop. And guess what? They're going to get up again. Yes, yes. So just because they had gotten up and they drop is no reason for you to say they never did get up at all. When they drop, each time they drop, help them get up. Amen. We don't reach the end of the race yet. That's why sometimes I, I kind of struggle when I hear people say, oh, I'm saved and I've been saved. We are all contending for our salvation right now. Bishop, you're on the floor, sir. It's your turn, your turn. Let me hear your way in on that matter. Hmm? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Two minutes, sir. All right. All right. Well, on that matter, if God save you, fill you with the Holy Ghost, and you are serving him, I have, I am not saying he should not go back there, but you have to make sure, she would have to make sure this is what God sent me back to, to the people. I, as a young boy, smoke. You, Bishop? Yeah. I got, <laughs> I, I smoke. I got saved when I was 18 years old. <laughs> but I, 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 I remember I smoked for about two years. Oh, my. And I, I go to dance hall. I got saved at 18 at 17 and up, I went to dance hall. And the Lord saved me. Glory to God. Now, if the Lord saved me, and I have to go back to preach to the people in the dance hall, I have to make sure, though, it's God sent me. Amen. It's not because somebody invite me to come. Yeah, you're going to make a fortune. And it's not because I feel like going back there. I have to make sure that God sent me. And I, maybe I would have to do like the man down in the New Testament. Ask God for a sign. <laughs> and when he got the sign, he still asked God for something else. Amen. Because these are things you have... It can destroy yes. another people. Yes, yes. And it can save people. Right. It can be a stumbling block for some individuals. So you have to make sure this is what God said. Yes, yes, yes. 
Yes, Bishop. We have to be careful God that we bless. don't let our liberty become an offense to others or a stumbling block to others. Yes. Praise the Lord Jesus. <laughs> Amen. It must be a calling. Yes. Praise God. Praise God. It must be a calling. Indeed. It's not a self thing. No. And sometimes we tend to judge people of their past. Mm -hmm. You understand? Mm -hmm. Yes, so, yes. Yes. And if God call you, clean you up while going back into God's garbage bin. Hmm. You know, so we have to keep praying them up. Praise God. All right. All right. All right. So very interesting, different views, different angles. But we understand that at the end of the day, this walk is so personal, brethren. And you may not understand the call that is on my life. I may not understand the one that is on your life. But it's important that we all are attuned to what God is saying to each of us and be purposeful in our mission to win the loss. Amen. It might involve us doing some uncomfortable things. It might involve us being judged by fellow believers. It might involve us moving out of our comfort zone. Amen. It might involve us giving up positions of comfort again. You know, so it's very important that we're hearing from the Lord so that we can endure those hardships. It's not an easy thing to witness all the time. Amen. All right, so at the end of the day, what is the impact that embracing the harvest as a family has on us? One, personal growth. Personal growth. When we participate in evangelism, we ourselves are strengthened in this walk because we are preparing to go out there. So whatever spiritual disciplines we exercise, the fasting, the praying, all of that, it turns around and it strengthens us and we grow. All right? So it leads to spiritual growth and stronger faith for all the family members. And wider community is transformed. All right? Barclay Street cannot be the same as it was many years ago because there's a lighthouse in here that still stands. And so it should be in your community, your house. Your house mothers must be that house where the guys on the road come and get some prayer. And they know when they're really hungry for God, they know where to run in the community. Amen. So once that starts happening, are we changing lives one by one by one? Then we will see whole communities, more souls being one for Jesus Christ. And that's what the harvest is about. So as families, let us commit to being a part of the harvest, starting with prayer and seeking God's guidance on how to best contribute. Amen. God bless you. Hope you have been encouraged to be harvesters as families. There are many souls out there waiting to hear the word. Don't let the harvest get overripe and rotten anymore. Let us get up and do what we've been called to do, families. God bless you. I'm going to hand back over to Sister Juliet at this time. Praise God. Praise the Lord, everyone. Could we just stand and stretch out ourselves a little? Praise God. Thank you. Those who came out late, but still, we, had a, we have learned a lot, haven't we? Just stretch out to Jesus right now. Praise God. What, didn't we learn a lot? Praise God. I'm going to ask you to sit before I let you stand again because I have an experience that I need to share. So you can sit. I was going to put up my hand to give it, but I said, since I'm going up, I will wait. Um, I have a vendor in somewhere of my community that I purchase fruits from. And he makes sure he puts up the best fruits for me. I'll pay for it. I'll pay because I believe in quality. And uh, this person is very respectful of me and the church. And I always am very, very happy 
to support him. One evening or one night, I had a vision of him or a dream, you might want to say. I saw him almost naked, his clothes fully down. He was covered, though, in underwears. And he really looked like somebody that I really wondered if I should keep company with in the dream. And when I woke up, I told it to Doc, and I really said, what do you think? I sh how should I respond to this dream? Because it was very forceful to me. And when I have morning dreams, I know it is really something that the Lord is showing me. It's for me now to discern what I'm supposed to do. And it, it, it went on for about two or three days. One evening, I had to leave work much later than usual. And I was surprised to hear the whole place was turned up with some music. When I say dirty, I don't even know how people make up those songs. And they were just playing in our atmosphere. And I said, wow, is that what is coming out? How should I? As a matter of fact, I, I made a decision right there now that this is where I stop with this person. I want you to tell me before I tell you the final outcome. What would you do if you were in my position? What would you want to say something? I want to hear before, because I got the answer afterwards, but I... At that time, I really wanted to. Brother Adrian, what would you do if you were in my... He's the, one that was the, the same person. I said, why am I seeing this person in this disgraceful condition in the dream? And just a couple of days after, I usually leave work, but I had to be at work late that night. Yes, yes, you can much. think why. He put on that music. And I never even know that people make up music like that, how dirty it was. Puffing it in the atmosphere. Yes, um, Sister Donnett. Remember I said I'm going to come back, but I want to hear your view. What would you do if you had a dream or vision like that? Praise yes. the Lord. All right, so that dream sounds like in some way he, he's, he's being shown in not a good light. So it could be that um, something he's involved in would be to his downfall, his detriment, disgraceful, etc. All right, you hearing now in the natural that he was, you know, playing that kind of music speaks to what his spirit is being fed. So to me, he has a need. Um, I'm not mad that you made the decision not to probably not to buy the fruits from him. No. Not to even go Not, near him. Well, well, I struggle with that. You won't be able to reach him unless you go near him. So that part I, 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 I struggle with. He has a need. He now needs you. <laughs> so he may not, he, you may not be allowing him to feed you. He needs to be fed now. And so if the Lord took the time to show you that in a dream, the responsibility is now yours to witness and to minister to him. Thank you so much. Anybody else? Sister Tracy, come this way. And then at the back, after Sister Tracy, okay? I had a similar dream about someone that was working for me. And I actually dreamt them naked in front of the house. And I inquired of the Lord too, what should I do? Because this person seemingly was a church-going person. And, um, you know, and then luckily for me, I went to a service and I was praying. Because God knew I was pondering about it. And I was pondering, okay, Lord, what, what does this mean? And just one word a prophetess gave me. She was just praying for me and she said, careful of your helper. And I, I didn't need anything else after that. I went home and I started to question the person. Um, 
I just felt that the Lord was leading me to say that this person is being revealed to you because they were hiding something that they were doing that you, did, you weren't aware of. And one day, I don't know how the obvious argument came up. And I said to, I was talking about something and I said, you know, so and so, da 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 da. She was silent. And then I said, oh, it come in like you believe in her obvious so. And she never said nothing more. And then she said, um, sometimes you have to go to your number. I said, eh? So it's like a red flag. It's like a red flag. Then I remember how I usually drink a cup of tea from this woman. And every time I drink the tea, I said to my husband, something about that tea here. It not tastes right. And him, uh, something I go on with this tea. And everything just came together. That weekend when she went home, I went to, because she was a living helper, went to look in her room, saw all kind of necromancy things in my house, under the bed, da da da. When she came Monday, I just told her to pack up and leave. Praise the Lord. Yes. Yes. I'm, I'm, I'm she first before you, Sister Romans, and then you after. Um, Sister Romans will be the last person. Bless the Lord, saints. Yes, praise the Lord. My take on that vision for me, because I, I have that experience once recently. So my take on that vision, as I would say, it's an uh, exposure of the person based on the person's um, attitude and, you know, things that they have hidden. The Lord has showed to you in a vision that this person is a disgraceful person, but he's, he hidden his um, disgracefulness. So because he know you're a woman of God and he wants to try to be respectful to you, so he tries very best to, you know, keep that away from you and to hide it. But the Lord is revealing it to you into a vision. Because I remember in last week, I got a vision about the same thing. And I, the vision that I got, I dream my daughter. And when I dream about my daughter and her two aunts, the situation that they were in, I never liked the situation that they were in. And I was above them. I was above them and they were in some dirty water and I was saying to them, but there was this crocodile coming after them and I was like, why is this crocodile lurking around? And I said, this could be like a form of an enemy, you know, and I kept aside, but I was above. I wasn't, you know, anywhere the water was and someone came up to me and said to me, um, where are you going? There's two, two ways. You know, that road is shorter, but, you know, it has less light on it. And you have that side where it, it is a longer journey, but it has more light to it. And I said, listen, it not really matter how far me have to go walk, I'm going to take it one way in more light there because at least me can see where am I going. And the person went away and the person said, thumbs up, thumbs up. And the person went away and I wake up the morning and I spoke to my daughter about the dream because... The dream wasn't rest well with me. I prayed about it before I even mentioned it to her. And I said to her that some disgrace is coming ahead. I don't know who, I don't know where. But I was, you know, talking to her and, you know, telling her that to be careful and she must pray. And saints of God, before the day went along, there was this huge argument that developed in my home pertaining to my daughter and my grandmother. And there, is, there goes the disgrace and everything. And, you know, and I was saying that God, is this he was really showing to me. So sometimes when you get these vision, sometimes the Lord is revealing some things to you, but you don't really understand. So what most I do, I pray about it and I ask the Lord to give me a revelation. And sometimes the revelation that we got we really don't really feel comfortable with it, but we just have to just accept it because we ask for a revelation. Thank you. So you just have to just be aware of that person. Yes. Yes. All be right. aware and pray for that person as well. Yes. Sister yes. Romans, what would you say? What do you do Praise if you were in Lord. my position? Yes, ma'am. I'm just taking a keen look at the scene that you have 
given us. And there are some words that come to my mind. I'm looking at deception. I'm looking at perception and even illusion. And, and by means of looking a little deeper, my mind took me back to the Garden of Eden, a choice food that was there, and the, the beautiful lady that God had in the garden. So here is this person who you also show respect for because you see the care that he has for you in um, providing you with the best that you are willing to pay for. And he respects you. Yes? And he respects the church. But a little later you are learning that this is deception. He didn't know you were there. If he knew you were there, he would not have done that. True. So based on the presentation that he is putting out, you are perceiving that this is a very good person, which is creating an illusion. And so because you have the Holy Ghost, then the Lord will reveal to you. And that's what we need in our everyday life. Because based on our perception, we can find ourselves being turned or distracted from what God has in store for us. And we become partakers of things that God does not want us to partake of. So the Lord did not want you to tarry in his presence for long. Because that's where Eve went wrong. She tarried too long. You know? With the enemy. And so she ate the fruit. And it's symbolic that it's fruits that you are buying from him. <laughs> so we can get a spiritual lesson from out of this. That when we are led, God will lead us. What we cannot see with our natural eyes, God will lead us in the spirit. So you have to make a decision, a firm decision, because the Lord showed you what was happening. Wonderful. So before you sit, Sister Romans, what should I do now? Should I just stop shopping with him or should I witness to him? I would start to plug something in. I would mm. still be going for the fruits, but I would find a nice little way of start to plug something in and to see his response and his reaction until you get to the point where you even say, you know, I heard, I was at work late one night and I really heard something coming from out here and so on. And you know, whatever, and see what his response is. Because somebody has already said, done it over there, doctor, please forgive me for saying Done it. Not a problem. Yes. This is yes. family business. <laughs> yes. Okay. Good. But um, you, you, you cannot just cut off the person like that. You have to find a way of reaching them. Is that Tracy agree? So when, when you do it. that, when you find that way and he's not responding, then the verse comes in that says, Come out from among them and be ye separate and touch not the unclean thing. So if we were Judaic and go back in the Old Testament, you would not want to be buying any fruit from him because he's unclean. Thank you. All right, so Tracy, final say, I don't know if Bishop want to close off with some, okay. an idea. Okay, you had your hand up? Yeah. I didn't I see, but something. I'm giving you a minute. Go ahead. I was saying something. I think from reading books, I know that naked is a disgrace. So God is showing you something that I, I don't think I would buy any more fruits from him. Because God is showing you something right in that vision. So I think you need to stay. I don't sister, think sister, to me, um, sister, just stand up right where you are for me. Yeah. Just keep facing the road. Turn back. Come back. Huh? Yes, I have to show them this. Yeah. I don't so think I'm I... looking for the answer from what you're saying. Turn yeah. your back and let me read what is on your back. So I must keep. Okay. <laughs> I just get an answer. <laughs> I have to skip. Because she got up right at the time where I'm trying to make okay. a decision. And the answer, my mother used to teach me that, that used to work with her every time. Every time she wants to an answer, she look up whether it's a billboard or something we're driving, God give her the answer. And we grow up like that. And then her blow says, skip him. Just skip. Okay, skip. Yeah. I don't know what the five stand for but i i get the answer and if i said the five i saw skip all right half a minute more for you yeah i said uh, i think naked is a disgrace sister Julie. yes I'm we know it. that nakedness is a so disgrace i think, I think we know that yes all of I us think, know yeah. that don't we know if you see somebody so, naked it's a disgrace i think god is showing you a vision there that 
you should look into that vision and see that you should you don't stay away from him. I don't think I would buy any more food from him because I think God is showing you something there in that vision. All um, right, Sister Tracy, let me hear what you say. And then Bishop is going to give me the final word. Yeah. Yes. Uh, Jesus, help us. Um, I think I answered it already in terms of how I dealt with it. Cut it off. Mm -hmm. um, you see, the Holy Spirit know more than me and you. The Holy Spirit know things that you and I cannot perceive. Right. Sister Roman said it. The perception, the illusion, you know, and the deception. And it, it is, you know, as we talk about going out to harvest. Yes. And even Sister Donnett mentioned that you cannot go out unprepared. Mm. You have to be prepared. Because these are the things that are out there. Yes. These are the spiritual things that you have to encounter that if you are not careful, it can, I don't want to, to, to you know, make anybody live in fear, but you have to be ready yes. because one of the things I taught my children as we're talking about families, uh, my children grew up and I said, don't eat a, eat a people yard. Yes. Don't, don't practice it right. because people will catch you with them food. Yes. And it may look like we believe in a necromancy or so, but no. But these are things that the, the, the devil used it to catch Eve. So why would you see an example like that and not warn your families when you're having your prayer times or your whatever? Boys, you know, a girl will like you and this is the way that she might choose to catch, to catch you. you, so be very careful. Make sure you pray over your food. Make sure you do this. And these are some of the things that we have to teach practical lessons because we live in a spiritual kingdom. And the wickedness of people knows no bounds. Yeah. And you just eating that fruit, you would be surprised as some of the incantations that can be spoken over that fruit that as you ingest it, you know, in a weakness, remember, the, the, the demons can't oppress you unless you give an opening. Unless there's a portal. So, in a moment of weakness, you would be constantly eating, eating, eating until one day when you're angry. Maybe, maybe, maybe Bishop Nepal rub you the wrong way one morning and you're just angry and you just eat the papa. And that's when these spirits attach themselves to allow the children of God to be led astray. So when the Holy Spirit leads you, show you something, listen, open up your eyes. We live in an environment now that we have to be spiritually discerning, spiritually aware. And we don't talk about this a lot, but this is how our lives should be run, by you not looking with your natural eye but looking with your spiritual eyes so that God can lead you and direct your path even when things seem like it's good because we are children of spiritual beings and we ought to be looking now. We pass the baby stage, repent and baptism. We all know that. We know the verse. We know it by heart. Come on. Let us walk in maturity now to guard our families against the wickedness that is out there and Satan is working over time. So when God shows you something, just move with God. You may not even agree with it, you know, but just move with God. All right, so don't even bother go back. Skip. Yes, Bishop, you agree that I should skip? Praise the Lord again. The Lord loves his people. The Lord watches over his people. The Lord protects his people. And when danger is coming, Skip. God shows you. And God has a way to show you in different ways. I think what you saw there, evangelist, is God showing you something, the danger. And sometimes the people that we take in, that are our worst enemy. And what you saw there is God warning you to be careful of what is going to happen. And you have to get rid of that. 
Um, you know, I, I give you a little story here. A preacher told me. Because sometimes you wonder what people hate you for. The, even the love of God in you. Sometimes you're doing your best and God is using you. And people don't like it. And they try everything to destroy you. A preacher gave me an, an example. He was a good preacher. And he moved up and down and people accept him as a good preacher. And he was invited to go to a place to run a revival. And other preachers covet him for what was happening. And they decided to put him into a hotel. And when he went into the hotel room, the Lord spoke to him and told him, somebody will be coming to knock on your door. Don't open the door. Plainly. And he said a few minutes after that, he heard a rapping on the door. And he would not open the door. And he said, who is that? Somebody that work at the hotel come to serve him something. He said, I don't need anything now. And he would not open the door, so the person went away. When he went down to the reception and inquired who was that person, they don't know who. But when he went back to his room, the Lord showed him some camera set up in the room. And it was a prostitute that set up to come in his room. So the Lord has showed him before yes. and warned him. They set up a prostitute to come into his room and the cameras were there. Yes, brethren. So be careful. Yes, sir, I will skip. Be careful and just do what you have to do. If you have to let that person get out, you have to get out. I would not entertain him anymore. All right, on these words, could we stand together? We are going to be collecting the day's offering. Did you learn anything today? Yes. As family, we have to stick together and do our best. We can achieve the harvest through the family with prayer, fasting together, teaching, and reaching many people. God bless you. Could we all stand? It's offering time. Praise God, praise God. Brother Adrian, just say a word for the offering at this time. Could we all stand, everyone? Yes. Oh, you were saying something? All right, carry the mic to her, but remain standing while you get your offering out. Yes. I was just listening. Um, we're talking about the harvest, and I was just listening. A lot of times the Lord put us on our guard, and I want to ask this question. Is this person a saved person? Not at all. Then the Lord is trying to show you him. But you have to lead by the spirit. Remember, he respected you. He respected the church. But he hid himself who he is. If you were there, he wouldn't have played those music. But you, you knew never I was know, there. you never know what the Lord have you to do in that situation. It might be you can go to him in the spirit of meekness, even though what he played is just a song and he, you said he doesn't respect you. But you come as a disciple. You come as a follower of Jesus Christ. You want to put something inside of him that is not there. And I wouldn't stop by him. I would pray. And I would extend love over all the situation that is going on. Because you never know by you talking to him and how you deal with him. Tomorrow, he can be a minister. 
He can be out there. Hakoshanda. Hallelujah. I have so many experiences. You see, we have to get this flesh thing off. And as the Spirit said, as the Word of God said, we should walk in the Spirit. That we should not fulfill the lust of the flesh. A lot of times we are going to be forced and see a lot of situations. But we have to ask God how to deal with it. Maybe yes. you are the one. You are the one. Nobody else. Because he hid himself. But just go to him in the spirit of meekness, gentle. And I would, let, I would still buy. But little by little, I would put the word in. Little by little, I would put the word in. And you never know what God is doing. All right. Thank you so much. We have had a wonderful day of discussion, like family. Of course, everybody's view cannot be the same. So let us just listen to each and every one. And then we close in prayer. God has the final say. Yes, Brother Adrian. Please Let's God. all stand for the blessing of the offering. And we want you to give a harvesting offering at this time. Have you been well fed? Yes. Yes. And it's, everything is so expensive. I just paid somebody for one of the meats. And I won't tell you how much I had to pay. It's a lot of money to feed the congregation. But together, we can do it. Tell your neighbor together. Together. Together, we can do it. God bless you. Brother Ernie, do we have the offering? Just come hold it up while we pray the blessings of the Lord. Praise God. Let us pray. Yes. Let's all stand. Father, I want to thank you for such a wonderful lesson. Lessons today, Father. I want to say that it's, it's a pleasure to be in your presence one more time just to partake of the spiritual food. And as, of your, as you have fed us spiritually, oh Father, I want to say thank you for everything. And we just want to give back a portion of what you have blessed us with, oh God, just to express our gratitude to you for all that you have done for us. Father, we understand that there's a blessing in giving. And so as we have received it right now, Father, we pray, oh God Almighty, that you will receive even this offering that we're about to give, oh God. We pray that it will be go, it will be go forward to the furtherance of your service as we continue, O oh God Almighty, to partake in this harvest in whatever way we can. Bless us now as we say thanks to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Amen. Please bring your offering. I must work the works of him who sent me while it's day. For when the night is come, the time for work will be done away. Will you be willing to work for Jesus any time and every day? He'll reward you when he comes to take his bride away. I must work the works of him who sent me while it's day. For when the night is come, the time for work will be done away. Will you be willing to work for Jesus any time and every day? He'll reward you when he comes to take his bride away. One day Jesus saw the blind man sitting by the wayside. The disciples asked him, Master, who did sin? He said, neither this man nor his parents, but that the works of God might be manifest in him. I must work the works of him who sent me while it's day. For when the night is come, the time for work will be done away. Will you be willing to work any time and every day? He'll reward you when he is bright away. Okay, Brother Adrian, your time to close off. And just bless the dinner also. 
Okay, praise God. Praise God. Did we have a wonderful day today? Yeah. Amen. Praise God. Amen. We did, did learn a lot. Praise God. So we're about to um, close off and we're going to be um, going upstairs, right, for the meal upstairs. Right, so please don't leave until you, get, you are fed. Amen. We are going to be just closing off in prayer at this time as we leave. Thank you, Jesus. Let us pray, Father. Father, I want to thank you one more time for such an awesome time in your presence one more time. I want to thank you for this wonderful family, for the Family Life Ministries. Oh God, you have blessed us in such a way through these wonderful speakers. Oh God, we don't want to take it for granted, oh God, that we have this space, this place, oh God, that we can come and be fed, oh God, by the women of God who can impart such great knowledge to us. And we pray that every person here today, that we won't leave here the same way that we came, that we leave here, oh God, with something to grab on to something that we have learned here today and to put it in practice, oh God, because we understand, oh God, that learning, Lord God, takes place when we would have put something in practice, oh God, to take something home with us, oh God, that our families will be better, our families, oh God, will become families that will go out and to make an impact in this world. Father, we understand the harvest is ripe, oh God, and we thank God for the families, for those who are here even right now, who will leave here and go back to their individual homes, oh God, and start to prepare laborers who would go out oh God, and to become harvesters, to become reapers in this time, oh God, that you need workers even more than ever. Oh God, bless us now. We thank you for this, for this organization, oh God, for every worker that is even here right now, that you'll continue to prepare us, to equip us, oh God, to do your work in this time. Thank you for opening our eyes, oh God, so that we can grow more in you, oh Father, and to even make this harvest a great harvest. We pray that we'll come back even tonight, oh God, to partake in the blessing even more. Oh God, and not just to partake in it, but to also be a blessing to others who are out there, who need the gift that you have given to us to impart to others. Bless us now as we say thanks. We pray for even the meal, oh God, that will bless it even now, oh Father. We pray, God, that it will just become a, a blessing to even our, a nourishment to our bodies. Father, we pray that, oh God, you'll continue to bless the givers, oh God, the hands that, that continues to prepare this meal, the hands that continues, oh God, to work even as a part of this harvest that is here right now. Bless and thank Keep us, O oh God, and help us to continue to do the work that you have sent us while it is day, because we understand that the night comes that we'll not be able to work anymore. Thank you for this opportunity to work for you. Help us to continue, O oh God, to take pleasure in doing your work. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. God bless you all in Jesus' name as you go.